So I'd like to start by asking our speakers one question for everyone quickly. What's the biggest challenge you've seen in implementing Lean? Is it, I, well, I'm, am I on? Am I on? Hello? Yeah. Just get the volume right. Uh, so, you know, uh, right, the last two weeks I've just spent traveling around the world talking to financial institutions, one in Africa, one in Ireland, one in the UK. And uh, first thing is the ego. Everyone's like, but we're a bank, but we're highly regu regu regulated, but we're a real company. <laughs> you know, and um, it, this is true. I'm, like, it's absolutely true. Uh, and, and the challenge I say to them is, okay, we can sit here and complain about how difficult it is to do something. Let's just do that. Or we can sit here and raise all the objections that you can think of as to why we can't do something. Or we can pick one thing, something very small, and focus on trying to have an impact on that. And finding out if we can move the needle, if we can actually achieve some success. And let's run an experiment at that level and get some momentum and get moving. Uh, and that normally makes them go, they check their behavior. They stop saying it, that we're so different, it's too tough. They stop raising objections and they flip to think about what is something small they could do. So I'd really recommend that would be a tactic to try. Okay. Yeah. 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 You go. All right. Hello. Um, I would think that there's a couple. One is leadership interest in doing it and not really understanding what lean really is. Um, but I would like to talk for just a few seconds about the other one, which is that a lot of people view lean as this process design strategy. And while it is that, and you have to do that in order to get to the end, it really is about a people development strategy. And it's really about getting everyone that is doing the work to be recognized as the experts in the work and helping design improvements and that type of thing. And I think Toyota has been pretty quick to say, you know, we don't build automobiles, we build people. And we're really just understanding the degree to which people development is important and teaching problem solving acumen across the organization is at, at the core of Lean. So a lot of people think it's just about process design and that's like this much of Lean. Okay, is this one? Yeah. Um, so, our, you know, Netflix is pretty lean in terms of how we operate, right? Every microservice team pushes when they want to, they develop. You don't really know that they've changed something. You just happen to pick up their jar when you build. So I think I'm actually seeing the inverse of it a little bit, which is the teams tend to be so decoupled and the tasks tend to be small enough that there's such local ownership that when it comes time to actually do projects that have to span many teams, that muscle isn't flexed much anymore. So I think once people step all the way into lean, they're going to find that as they're leaning in, no pun intended, um, <laughs> they're, they're going to find that running a large project that actually requires a lot of coordination can be very challenging, and sometimes that hits us. Do you know if there are yeah. any big challenges with HS2? Yeah, yeah well, I, I don't particularly have the yeah. HS2 thing, but I've, I've been talking to a lot of companies that are going through this kind of challenges, and there's, there's, um, there's, there's, the, there's a bunch of drivers for this, but if you think about, a lot of time they call it the digital transformation. That's sort of, that's sort of a shorthand buzzword that the, the, the sort of CIO will, will generally have heard of, because that's kind of how they talk about it at that level. And one of the things that's driving this is, you know, maybe per customer, the amount of information per customer that you're processing, you know, typically everyone has some kind of customers, maybe goes up by an order of 1,000. Yeah. So it's having just a little bit of information that you base your business off and you work against the big averages and you build products that are very averaged across who you think your customers are. Now you have lots of very specific information about that particular customer. You've got a mobile app, so you've got interactions with particular people. So it's not just, you know, I own a bank branch and people come in and take money out every now and again. They're interacting with you at a much different level. That's driving a lot of the sort of, well, how do we deal with this? And, how do, and then they look out at the companies that have figured out how to deal with these high volumes of interactions, which are the large-scale web companies, and then they're trying to copy that. So this is the drive of top-down. You see, the executives quite often get, we need to do all of these things, and Lean is part of it, Agile is part of it, DevOps, Cloud. These are all pieces of, that, of their response to doing that. 
And then when you get down to the, the bottom level, quite often the engineers are all quite you know, gung-ho to go and try this stuff. And then somewhere in the middle, there's this middle management, oh. right? That, that, are, that they own a process, or they own something, or, or they kind of get a bit set in their ways. And what I often see is that's the challenge, is, is bringing that middle tier of management and it practices because they're worried about they're going to be reorganized and will they still have a job and all that kind of stuff. But the individual engineers usually get it and, and the high level management are increasingly getting it and are trying to push it down. I think what's happening generally is they're picking a team. Uh, if you look at the, uh, like the Nordstrom example from DevOps Enterprise Summit is a good one. They had one team that went and just went very deep. So you go deep with a team, you figure it out, then you do it with another team. and You keep doing these teams one at a time. The original Netflix transition to cloud looked like that, that, is, that as well. We took one team at a time, and we kind of got them over the hump to figure out what was this new thing they were playing with. Okay, so now we'll go to some of the audience questions for Barry. Is it a contradiction to be big while also having a lot of smaller ideas? Um, big as in a big company. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, so I can think of an example. Uh, Google, is that a big company? Okay, and if I go to Google Labs, and look at the kind of things that they're doing in there, or the kind of things that they launch about how they fi find these next big things. Uh, like, I think Gmail's another good example of that, right? The, and, and probably Labs is the equivalent of maybe their alpha phase, right? Because stuff is happening that we don't even know about. They're experimenting in their Horizon 3 that we just don't know about. Uh, it's only when they start to get some confidence and they'll start to show that out, right? So. It's one thing to be a big company. Yes, always keep thinking big. But as we said, and even Dan kicked off the whole uh, Agile pieces, in the 90s we were thinking big and doing big projects. And we know where that goes. Like, uh, you know, I, I think that conversation needs to be put down. I think all the fantastic work Nicole's done to show that these things don't work. You know, so we, we need to apply a different strategy. You need to think big, you need to learn fast, you know, you need to start today. Think of those small little things you can do to test and experiment with customers, what's gonna work, make your business successful tomorrow. Um, and it's the problem, right? Because most execs are still, and teams are trapped in, think big, build big, 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 big money. You know, everyone loves, oh, my budget, my budget's 100 million, how much is yours? Like, this is the planning process, right? This is what happens in annual budgeting cycles. I go in, I want 100 million. Karen's like, oh, he's going to say 100, so I better say 120. Nicole's like, well, I'm going to go 150. And then we'll all make it up, and we'll all do a dance, and whoever's got the best presentation in the deck, and whatever it is, and like, this is lunacy. It's absolute lunacy. You know, take a dollar. Go test some stuff out, you know? And, and like, these are the things that matter, right? And we need to get into this mindset. Um, that's the only way you're going to achieve high performance, and you're going to stay relevant and stay alive. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, for Karen. If I asked my boss, he'd say that everything we do adds customer value. How do we actually determine what does add customer value? Good question. Um, so there's a couple different ways. One is talking to customers and asking. It's a long art that uh, isn't always done. And so asking customers if you can get direct access to them is one way. Another way is to wear their shoes. You just learn how to walk in other people's shoes and, and you know, take, take your developer hat off and put your customer hat on and, and imagine being that person. So imagination can carry you a bit as well. The other thing is, is that there's always a, a financial kind of a game that we play when we're mapping where we say, if the customer knew the incremental cost of this activity, would they be willing to pay the incremental cost of it? Or would they rather have it taken out? And so that's another way that you can kind of you know, think through whether or not the customer is likely going to value something is by putting a monetary value on it, even though it's, it's kind of a fake game, but it is a way that you're able to get clearer on customer value. I hope that, and, and, and whoever asked that, if we can always talk a little more during break and lunch and things like Thanks. that too. Okay, Coburn, yep. is there any difference between so-called blue-green deployment and Netflix's red-black? I'm not familiar with blue green. I'm just mm. Mr. Red Black. They're totally different colors. <laughs> <laughs> they are different colors. That's, it. that's so, really the only difference. So someone might have. Yeah, does anybody have the it's just, details? It's just yeah. It's just two colors. Pick, okay. pick any two colors. Doesn't matter. Okay, I have I have a question for Orange Adrian. Green. As a venture <laughs> capitalist now, oh. 
Okay. How do do you use agile, lean, and rugged concepts, but particularly lean because we know it's the best and the best track here? Um, <laughs> do, do you use these concepts as you evaluate potential investment opportunities? No, mm, don't think so. What do you use when you evaluate potential investment opportunities? It, it's um, take notes, kids. <laughs> I'm going to. I think about that. Um, I mean, there's a process it goes through, but it's it's a fairly lightweight process. Um, it kind of depends on the size of the deal. So I guess you could say it's sort of lean. It's not a one size fits all. all right. So if somebody's doing a um, like a seed deal for for a few hundred thousand dollars, then there's uh, much less oversight, much less. Uh, the, the whole company doesn't have to be involved. There's a, there's an accelerated process. The simple pay. It's, you make it lightweight. Small right? bets. So it's small bets, right? But there's lots of small bets, and you're sort of averaging across those small bets. But we we're a there are lots of different kinds of VC firms, right? But Battery is a full spectrum firm, so we do 100k to 100 million. If we're putting 100 million into something, there's a huge amount of diligence. <laughs> there's a lot of people looking at it for a long time to decide. It's usually a pre-IPO round or something like a very late stage round. So we do do those, and uh, we. Yeah, we will go and talk to everybody. We will find customers that use this technology and talk to them about you know, how much you're expecting to spend over the next few years on it, try and validate all the assumptions behind the business model. And that's an enormous amount of research goes into it. So it tries to, we try to make that scale with the size of the deal that, that we're into. So I guess cool. that's. Thank you. OK, so. more questions for Barry. What's the biggest challenge you see um, in breaking through barriers in the old way of thinking, what's the best trick or a trick you've been able to suggest that people use? Oh, well, like a, 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 a mindset is, is a, a big challenge, right? But I, I think this is where I talk a huge amount about helping people go through an experience to break their model. Uh, a great example is we were working with a very large telecommunications company in Australia. And uh, we were doing this sort of customer journey mapping, talking to people to understand what some of the challenges people were facing with about trying to get a phone, just trying to get a phone set up. And we're presenting this back to uh, the leadership team. And they're just like, no, nope. no, that's not, that's not the way the process works. No, nope. I designed it. It works like that. Yeah, that's wrong. So the task we set them was this. We all gave them all credit cards. We put them in a room for 30 minutes. And we told them to go and buy a phone. <laughs> so they learned pretty quickly. They experienced, their mental model changed because they had an experience of what it was like. So that's the thing I often try to do as a trick, is create an experience where people can go and see and experience what it's like for a customer or another party and, and make that happen. Okay. We need that magician from last night. <laughs> yeah. no. Actually, just, just to tie that back to, to my experience at Netflix, at some point, at one point there was like free Netflix accounts for employees, and actually they took it away. They said, we're going to give you some dollars every year, which you're supposed to use to buy some Netflix. We want everyone at Netflix to go through the customer sign-up process with a real credit card and go through the billing process and actually live it for real. And then you're free to just not even have a Netflix account, don't really care. But, but then that, so that was one side. And the other one is that every staff meeting at the beginning, you go around the room and say, so what have you watched on TV recently? Right? And there would be you know, 10 minutes or an hour long this, you know, meeting would be people talking about content. And it really, it's, it's this problem is the company exists to provide this content. So it gets you oriented around the fact that the value is you know, the enjoyment of content. And people would just talk about what they'd watched and what they thought of like series. Not all just on Netflix, but stuff they'd found anywhere. And people would be swapping ideas about things to watch. So making you know, the product of the company, and this is technical, it's talking about the cloud this is the cloud platform team talking about which, what, you know, the latest show that they're watching, right? So bringing your, your, your sort of mindset to what is the actual value that you're providing is important. So we have Doctor Who, right? <laughs> we had a follow on for Coburn. What is Red Black? Oh, what is Red Black? So it's just the term we use when we're going to roll in a new version of the code, and then we'll gently roll traffic over to the new version of the code in the auto scaling group. And if there's a problem, we'll roll back. So which one's red? Which one's black? I always get this wrong. <laughs> this is they not alternate. good. Doesn't I matter. think they just alternate. I mean, people don't actually. Li I mean, after you do it once, a, you know, once every day, you don't really have a red it's or black. It's just old and new. It's just model. It's like old and new. It could be one and two, right? Okay. Mm. 
So we don't um, use that's why we don't use it that much as a term. We just do push. So I'm going to give you another one. Are you tied to AWS, or would it be easy for you guys to move to Azure, Google Compute? Is that for Microsoft that question? <laughs> We have a button, no. Um, uh, we're pretty invested in Amazon today. They're an excellent partner for us because we got in early. Um, we leverage a lot of their services, right? So we use EC2, SQS, SNS, SES, you know, S3, RDS, EMR. Um, there's a lot of services that I think the other vendors don't necessarily provide at the stage they're at. We think Amazon's still sufficiently ahead of the game and we have some relationship where we can help drive through our platform and open source, we can drive better adoption and get the features we want to some degree. So um, in the near term, there's no plans to really look at other cloud vendors. But you know, if Amazon overnight went out of business or something, we'd probably have to pivot pretty quickly and figure out how to get that to run mm -hmm. somewhere else. But we're hoping that's not going to happen. Okay. I think it's also a matter of scale. Um, at the scale Netflix is at, I don't think any of the other clouds could actually take it. Even quite a long time ago, I was talking to somebody from Rackspace saying, can we run on Rackspace? I says, okay, this is how many machines are there? Yeah, we can't do that. <laughs> so, it's like that. So you get into that and you can't fit. I call it like you can't, you want to be a small fish in a big pond for, to get the statistical averaging to work so that you can scale and it does look elastic. If the pond's big enough, it looks like as big as the ocean, right? If you're a small fish. But if you're a shark in a paddling pool, your head sticking out one end, you know, it's, it's not good, right? So you, you, can, you have to be, there have been times at Netflix where we were very much dominant users of a feature and every time we, we twitched, that feature broke, right? So you, those that tried to stop using those features or encourage lots of other people to use those features by doing open source tools. So that was one of the reasons for having the open source platform was to get more people using auto scaling or whatever feature that we thought we were, we were like one of the dominant users of. So I think that there is a problem in that Netflix is just small enough to fit on AWS and, and AWS is sort of make sure it's, it's big enough to run. Netflix yeah. and you know and then if Netflix it, AWS has to keep growing fast to, for Netflix to continue to stay to still still fit inside that platform. Okay, question for Karen. How does value stream mapping relate to agile where agile significantly limits the degree of upfront clarifying of what the customer needs in mm. order to iterate work faster? Yeah, so there's clarification and then there's clarification. So uh, when you're going through small iterations, you still have to be crystal clear about what you're doing for that small iteration. So what, when I talk about lack of clarity, it's when the clarity that the people need to do the work, no matter how big or small, it is just not there. And you have to work to get that clarity to get to the next level. Now, it may be very well designed that you're only gonna get to that next level and then you're gonna figure out where you go from there, as in rapid iteration. Um, but you still have to be clear when you start that cycle or people will waste time and get frustrated. Do you have anything else you want to say about clarity? No, no, but uh, like uh, in terms of value stream mapping, it's a fantastic tool. Like uh, we, we use it a lot when we're helping people build continuous delivery pipelines. Uh, you know, and, and it's a great way to sort of follow the, follow the work, right, through the whole organization. But understanding where you are, getting your current condition, but don't forget you need to also set a target condition that you're trying to work towards and focus on the target condition and experiments to get to it, not just do a map right. and then chase down all the waste hunt stuff, because that's, right. you, know, you just don't do it that way. So out of the audience, who here does a value, you know, actually creates a value stream for what they're building? There's a few of you, a just a few of you. Wow. So it's a, something you think you're yeah. gonna go back and try and figure out, is that, does look like a, people kind of seeing the, seeing the value of value stream mapping? Let's get a bit recursive here. Well, well, so there's the value stream itself is one thing. The, the Wadley map has is, is, is got this extra thing, which you, you take all the things in your value stream and you try to figure out where they're where they evolved to. Are they an agile thing that needs to be created from scratch? Is it a sort of a lean, best in class, but I'll probably buy it as a SaaS product or I'll download one of the many open source projects that does that, but I don't have to build it myself. And on the right hand side, You've got the things that are just commoditized where you can buy the, exactly the same thing from 10 different vendors, right? You, know, it's, you, know, you can buy a Pentium chip in a box from 10 different vendors. You don't have to go and sort of custom build your own chip architectures, right? So there's, there's those things where it's really commoditized. So understanding where in your value chain different things appear is, is important. And it varies a lot by industry. You know, people usually draw power in the bottom right corner, but if you're Tesla, it's on the left side. 
right? They invented a new power plug that, for superchargers. You know, there's a whole bunch of really interesting new stuff happening in, in power delivery, but only if you're doing electric cars, right? If you're just plugging machines in in a data center, that's not, very, not, not a particularly interesting area. So this is actually an interesting follow-on question. It came under Karen, but I think all of us can maybe kind of address this. Um, people are willing to pay for quality software. In the mobile space, the opposite seems to be true. Why do you think so? Sorry, I just missed the second part of that. Um, in the mobile the space, the opposite seems software? to be true. Yeah, in mobile, yeah. people don't seem to be willing to pay for software. They just want a free download on their phone. Why do you okay. think this is so? so uh, that, uh, from a customer perspective? From a customer perspective, you know, no one wants to, like, I'm not going to, I rarely pay for anything that I can get on my phone. I want all of my phone software to be free. I pay for no ads. That's interesting. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so Karen just said, I'll pay for no ads. I'll pay and for no ads. I will That's sometimes pay for no ads. Okay, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's interesting. It's, it's, from my point of view, I probably would take that as a product manager type approach. Like, what, what's the benefits of a freemium? Model like obviously WhatsApp, you have to pay a dollar, right? So they they did that to get some money to test if people would use it or not. Um, you know, I, I I constantly get asked this question when people are trying to develop their business models about how they will generate the revenue from it, and um, th that's that's probably one of the most profound questions. Like as a customer, you that's what you probably see, right? Do I have to pay a dollar? Is it free? How am I going to generate the revenue if I'm a marketing company, for instance, like Google and Facebook, who are just a marketing company? You know, they are going to extract value from you as a customer in a different way. They are going to take all your data and use it to leverage inf uh, businesses to sell to you. And so, you know, from a customer perspective, there's a, a whole other side to this to say, would I pay for security of my data? Would I pay for anonymity of what I do and what I do on the internet? So there, it, it's a very complex thing from a customer side, but when I talk to businesses, they're the kind of questions I ask them. What's their revenue model? How do they plan to grow? Where do they see success for this as a product as they go? But from a customer, I'd ask you that question. Um, if you're just like, I want something free to play with, okay, but you're also paying a cost at some level, whether you're aware of it or not. Uh, so maybe just be a bit more deliberate when you think about that, I suppose, as a customer. That's what I do. Um, and it's important, right? These, these things are important. They're the issues of our age. Your anonymity, how you care about your own information, who gets that information, and how it's leveraged for you. Uh, if you want to give your stuff to marketing companies, that's your choice, right? For free. <laughs> um, you know, I think another consideration is even free apps, if they're crappy free apps, people don't want to use them. And so there's still a quality determinant even in the free space. And so it's just really a matter of getting to understand your customer and deciding which business you want to be in. Which, which market do you want to go after? I mean, there are very thoughtful decisions to be made in a business strategically on, you know, we're not going to have low cost software. We're just not. We're going we're gonna to go into the upper echelon space. And, um, and then there's the opposite. And then there's everything in between. And so I think that there's in each you know, level that you're at, whatever the cost is, there's still a quality component that you have to be focused on. Um, and that's, that's where that quality differentiation comes in. My guess is it's a function of the playground, right? I mean, when you think about if mobile devices hadn't evolved, we would have the same game going on on your laptop, and you would want just as many free apps. But I mean, how many apps are there in the App Store now? Like 500,000 or something? I think it's like, yeah, I think it's like 1,000, 2,000 a day. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah, so it's totally fragmented. Or awesome. Yeah. It's kind of like yeah. the pay paywalled uh, websites is sort of the, the desktop version of that. Yeah. yeah. Just annoying. Um, there's, I mean, you could, I could just talk forever about business models for companies, right? <laughs> That's one, yes. of the, one of the big topics um, when we're trying to figure out startups. So, so there's a couple of things to just think about. If you're selling into the enterprise IT space in particular, which is where I focus a lot of my time, you've got to decide early on whether you're going to be selling to the CIO on the ops side, which means you end up doing a few large deals and you tend to buy higher enterprise sales type people. And, um, and you, you, know, you can make good business there, and you generally get cash positive fairly early, but you end up with a, a relatively limited market, because you end up in like the Fortune 1000, and then you start having trouble finding 
more customers. The other way is to go uh, for the developer viral approach where you basically say, I'm not going to charge anything for this. It's going to be free for developers. I'm just going to flood the developer space until every developer has this. And then the CIOs will end up buying support or something or something. You'll monetize it in some way uh, later on. Then it's very hard to do both of those. So you have to kind of pick one. And for that, you typically need more money, need more money because you make, you make your revenue less later. You make your revenue later in the process. But because you've got such a bigger market of adoption, you tend to make more later. So it's a sort of a sharper hockey stick, right? It's flat for a long time. But if you win, you win bigger uh, than if you do something that's uh, selling to enterprise. I mean, both are viable, but you've got to be clear what you're doing uh, on which one you're trying to do. Very good. Okay, I don't see any other questions coming in, so I think we are good. Thank you very much to all of our speakers. Right. It's lunchtime. Thank you. Thank you.